Welcome to the building process of a life-size stop-motion puppet of a cheetah head. A story of trial and error. <clears throat> that was a mouthful. The first thing I did once I decided on this project was to research cheetahs, to draw sketches of their body proportions and the different facial expressions they are capable of. Doing research on the animal you want to build beforehand is vital, as in order for something to truly look as realistic as possible, every nuance needs to be taken into account. Other than researching the animal you want to build, it's important to see what iterations of the animal might be already out there. So I went to work, forcing through many making-offs and behind-the-scenes videos, and I came up with... Uh, not much. There's the occasional handheld puppet, like the one in the Lion King musical, and there is a 2D animated one in the original Lion King, and a 3D one in the remake, but they don't really count. It doesn't look much better on the animatronic front. I mean, there's this one, but I wouldn't really call it realistic. It seems like I might be the first person to ever build a realistic looking stop motion puppet cheetah. Which is kind of exciting, but also means I like examples. If only I was building a lion, I would be swimming in examples. Speaking of, if you can't find the exact animal you want to make, Looking at similar ones can still be a great help, like Aslan in Narnia or this random leopard I found. Getting a look beneath the skin is great and will help me with my mechanic placement later on. I think now I'm ready to start the building process. This was a long and difficult journey. Needless to say, mistakes were made. Many of them. So just for fun, I decided to add a counter. Once I had familiarized myself with the cheetah, I started by sculpting the head out of monster clay. I should have built the head smaller, you'll see why. To ensure the eyes were the correct size, I had ordered some from a taxidermy store. Please don't ask me why a taxidermy store offers the eyes of a severely endangered species. Once the sculpt was finished, I handed it over to the Staffordshire University resin technician Joshua Sibley to build the form. Here's how he did it. First, you lay down a layer of silicon, then you cover it in fiberglass. He then sent this to me. I removed the original sculpt and covered the inside in a thin layer of soft crafting clay. To ensure the clay layer is the same thickness everywhere, I used a pasta maker. A trick I had learned in my work with special effects artist Georg Korpus. The soft clay layer should be the thickness you want the skin to be. In my case, around 3 to 4 millimeters. You should make the eyelids and other areas where a lot of movement should happen a little thinner to ensure for some squash and stretch. Then I added a layer of epoxy clay in. Once hardened, you can remove the soft clay. Then spray the form in a layer of separator. In my case, I used Ease Release 300. Then I mixed some Ecoflex silicon. Now's the time to mention that the reason I decided on silicon for the skin is that it moves more like realistic skin rather than the more commonly used foam latex. I will later come to regret that, but I am jumping ahead and this process is confusing enough as it is. So the question now is what to color the silicon. It should have the same color as the skin of the real animal, right? Well, what color is the skin of a cheetah? Who knows? I was unable to find any information on that. The internet is sadly lacking in the shaved cheetah department. I looked at this 3D model of the artist Tristan... Um... Cordobo? Borf? Who colored the skin on the face of his model like this. I thought I was smarter than that and could save on time by just making it black. <coughs> color the silicon in the color you want the fur to be. Otherwise the silicon will shine through and look out of place. Anyway, moving on. I then filled the silicon into the form and pressed in the inner form. Use the thin stretchy fabric of tights to lay in the form at areas that are prone to ripping before pouring in the silicon, like the eyelids and the mouth corners. Another trick I learned from Georg but seemed to keep forgetting. After the silicon curing time is over, you can remove it from the form, dusting it with flour or baby powder to remove the stickiness. Don't dust the outside if you still plan to paint it, as the paint won't stick as soon as it's dusted. I placed the face back inside and filled the rest with construction foam. Once that cured, you can use it as the base to poke the hair in. Then I poked the hair in. Please ignore the needle markings as I forgot about the ears. So, hair. 
There are two ways on placing hair onto skin, flocking or punching. Flocking is done with a flocking gun. You lay down a layer of prosade glue onto your surface and then load the surface with positive energy, while the flocking gun is loading the fur negatively. Then you shake the fur onto the glue and the opposite energy makes it stand on end. You can then train the hair to sit in the correct direction by combing it with a brush. This is a great and quick method. The only problem is it only works on foam latex, as there is no glue that will stick to silicon like that. You can flock it, but it will always rub off. So for silicon you need to use hair punching, which means stabbing the hair into the head separately. It takes just as long as it sounds. After punching for a while, I realized that the silicon stretches due to the fur being added, and after consulting with Georg, I knew I would have to start over, as the only way to fix this is to just make a smaller sculpt from the get-go to anticipate the stretching. So I sculpted the face again, but smaller this time. Due to a lack of sculpting tools on my vacation, I used an old piece of bread to add texture. This time I also sculpted the ears as separate silicon pieces. I then placed it on the windowsill. The sculpts ended up melting in the sun. So I started over again and sculpted head and ears one more time. I covered the head in silicon. I used the wrong type of silicon. There is apparently two types, addition and condensation silicon. If you use the wrong two together, the skin silicon won't cure. Here's how I build the form for the ears. First I build the floor of the form out of Lego. Then I placed the ears and covered it in a fiberglass paste. Then I flipped the form over, added Lego to the bottom and after spraying some more separator, I drilled a hole into my clay to ensure some space for the joints. Then I added some paste to the top. This worked so well that I tossed the wrong silicon form and the half cured face I created into the trash and covered the head in the fiberglass paste too. If you want to make a hard outer mold, you need to make it a two-part mold. Otherwise, the demolding of the inner part is gonna get really hard. Then I removed the sculpt and placed down the soft clay layer. And I started adding the paste as the inner core mold before I realized that I wouldn't be able to get those molds apart if both parts were hardened. So instead, I used the paste to give the mold some legs so it would be able to stand nicely. Then I made the inner mold out of silicon. <sighs> just, just don't. I mixed the skin silicon again in black, same reasons as before. Also by pouring in the silicon, I realized why a soft inner mold is a bad idea, as it started to compress inward. In a panic, I filled the inside with reusable gloves and miraculously, that worked. Now I tried to do the construction foam thing again, so I covered the head in tape so that I would have a stable form to fill the foam in. There's no point in explaining what I'm doing as it did not work out and was mostly done because of the mistake of using a harder outer mold. Long story short, the construction foam didn't cure, I have no idea why and I don't care to know at this point. So instead I built an inner head out of upholstery foam by gluing pieces together and ripping and cutting it into shape. The reason why this soft part is needed is so that you have something to pull the face over and punch in the hair. If this inner core is hard, your needle will break off at every punch. Speaking of needle, there are two options for punching needles. Either you buy a felting needle or you use a sewing needle to build yourself a punching needle. This is done by cutting the top of the needle eye, then breaking one of the legs and filing down the remaining stump a bit. The thicker the needle, the more hair gets punched at once, and especially in areas where you will see the hair, like the top of the nose and the lower lid, you should use the finest needles possible. Now I use pictures of real cheaters to mark the fur direction. You always want to start punching at the point the arrow points to, as layering the fur on top is easy, while trying to punch the fur under already punched fur is really hard. While punching, I trimmed the fur on the inside and outside, so that I can already see what it will look like. I came about this far until I realized that the dark skin was a mistake, and furthermore, using fake fur, which is what I had been done until then, was also a mistake. As the fur is much too thick, it not only widens the silicon, it also stiffens it, taking away the flexibility, which is kind of the most important part.
and the black skin skimmered through everywhere. So I started again. I molded the head in cream colored silicon, ran out of the Ecoflex halfway through and without a care in the world I poured in dragon skin. And somehow that worked. None of that is how the professionals do it, but I was running out of money at this point to buy more silicon of the same kind. I then followed Georg's advice by using thinner hair. I used goat fur this time, the same that I was going to use for the body. I also punched the hair with a very fine felting needle. I still failed in punching in the hair one at a time. They are still at least 10 hair per hole, but not the thick chunks I worked with on the other head. And through the light skin color there was no out of place black showing through. One side effect of using the felting needle was for some reason that I constantly stabbed myself, often all the way through the thumb. This did not happen with the sewing needle and I don't know why it's happening with the felting needles. Regardless, I bandaged the fingers and soldiered on. I finally finished, and I hate the way it looks, but to be honest, I have the same struggle with everything I make. I usually hate it up until it's done, so I was not too concerned, but I did calculate the nose wrong. It disappeared between the fur and looked weird. Whenever you sculpt the head of something you plan to add fur to later on, you need to keep the added thickness in mind while sculpting. But I'm not going to start over. In my long experience in making puppet, the end product is always an amalgamation of failed plans, disjointed parts, to somehow look good. So I just swiftly cut off the nose of one of my previous failed attempts and glued it on top. Now let's pause on the face for a moment and move on to the skull, which will hold all of the mechanic joints. The uni technician Josh made it by covering the inner silicone mold with a thin layer of fiberglass. I then sketched out the little parts which I expected to remove and where I plan to add the joints. Most of these plans were changed later on, so don't pay too much attention to what I'm doing here. Now as you can see, I also ordered a set of jaws from a taxidermist. They are casted out of a mold taken from a real cheetah. I ordered a few joints in different sizes from a stop motion supplier and started playing around with them, trying to anchor them in a way they would be able to move all the parts I wanted to move, which included the sides of the upper lip, eyebrows, nostrils and the jaw itself. After I added the metal rods in the right length to the ball joints, I silver soldier them together, which is done by heating up the ball and the rod until they glim orange. I then hold my silver solder on top, heat it up until it melts and fuses both pieces together. I then drop them into cold water. Then I use a thermoplastic called polymorph, which is dropped into some near boiling water. Then I wait until it turns clear, from which point on it is sticky and sculptable, until it turns cold and opaque again. I used it to cover the ends of some of the rods to give them a better surface to glue the silicone skin to. Here I roughened up the jaw piece so that the polymorph plastic had an easier time sticking to it. I added a small blob of polymorph to the back of the eyeball and stuck a ball joint into it to give it some eye rolling movement as completely still eyes are quite freaky and unnatural. By placing the jaws into the mouth, I eyeballed where the joints would have to be and what part of the cheeks to cut to allow for movement. I shortened the cut-off pieces and rechecked their movement by holding them up to the head and then attached them to the joints. I drilled holes into the skull to stick some rods into that so that I could anchor the jaws into place. After the head looked like Pinhead from Hellraiser, I moved on to the ears. A piece of wire was covered in some fabric, some old tights, so that the silicon had something to grip onto. A Lego structure was built to help the ear molds stand up correctly. After sewing on the fabric, I placed the ear wire into the ear molds. I 
I used yellow, white and pinkish skin color to color the silicone. I mixed the color in half of the silicone and then mixed both halves together. I poured the silicon into the ear molds. The fabric here soaks up the silicon and covers the wire. If you put the wire in without the fabric, you run the danger of the wire poking and ripping through the silicon. I painted the back of the ears black, like a cheetah's. <coughs> which ended up somewhat useless as the fur covered it completely. Also turns out most cheaters actually have white dots at the tips of the ears. I corrected that mistake later, but it's another example why the research of the animal you want to create is so important. I glued tufts of fur to the top where the wire was in the way of punching. I then punched the fur on the inside of the ear and glued the fur onto the outside as the fur otherwise starts interfering with each other. Then I unpacked my mortal enemy, my airbrush. Here's a perfect demonstration as to why I hate that thing. It's the devil. I cleaned it three times and all I got was bubbles. So after the 500th time cleaning, spraying five seconds and cleaning again, I gave up and resorted to using a brush. Using very little paint on the brush, you can rub it into the fibers. Depending on what fur you are using, the paint will hold better or worse. Since I worked with real fur, it kept losing the color, making especially the blacks seem grey and lifeless. Later on I used Copic marker ink, which seemed to do the trick. When coloring in the markings, it is especially important to pay close attention to pictures of the animal. You might think you know what it looks like, but it's always better to be safe than sorry. Like I said, I painted the back of the ears black, only to realize my mistake later. Cheetah's ears are white at the tips, so I used the airbrush cleaner foam to rub the paint back off. This worked fairly well. I would still suggest to do it right the first time. I guess the theme of this video should be, I suggest you do it right the first time. After finishing the paint job, I gave the cheetah another quick haircut. Once fully painted, I moved on one last time to the skull. This is what the skull currently looks like. Almost all the joints are in place. I repainted the jaw to cover up the construction marks. It was very hard to match the gum color, especially since I couldn't use my airbrush, as that thing still seems to identify as a bubble machine.
I also painted the back of the skull black, as you will be able to see it if you look in through the mouth, and I didn't want that. Then I enlisted my flatmate Federico Pizzaresi, a major in 3D modeling, to build me a set of eyelids. Don't ask me how he managed to work with my drawings. The finished eyelid molds were then 3D printed. Afterwards, I had to remove the printing supports and then screw them into the skull. After the lids were set in place, I had to add a little support so that the lower lid had a natural stop and couldn't get stuck so low where I wouldn't be able to reach it anymore. This next step is a lot of fun and adds a lot of life to the puppet, adding whiskers. For whiskers, you will need feathers, which you prepare by ripping the fluff off the stem, which will be the whisker. A trick taught by Stan Winston school teacher Deborah Galvez in her video on fur. I attached the whiskers by stabbing them through the upper lip using a hair punching needle. I then glued them to the inside once I was satisfied with their placement. I wish I had turned the whiskers so that they all would point downwards, as that is what whiskers naturally look like. I haven't found a way to change their direction after gluing them down. Maybe heat could work, like a curling iron or something? I added some finishing touches, like painting the nose and lower lip. Painting the nose gave the whole head a much more lively look. The only thing that will stick to silicon is silicon. So the way I'm painting it is by mixing the silicon pigment with a bit of silicon glue and then some lighter fluid to thin it out. I added some fabric around the eyes and mouth to prevent tearing. It's probably a good time to mention now that the fur should be glued in from the inside once you finished punching. Regardless of what you do, that thing will always lose a lot of fur, but gluing it certainly helps. I drilled some holes into the skull for the needle. Then I finally pulled the skin over the skull and used the needle and thread to sew the skin onto the skull. The reason I decided to sewing the skin in place is that I wanted to be able to easily remove it so that I could reach the inside for repairs. And it also holds up better than glue. And now I'm finally done. 
There's probably something to be said here about the dangers of perfectionism, but I hate it. I'll start over. Just kidding. Well, kinda. I don't hate it, but I do want to do it all over again, utilizing all I learned from this process. I hope you enjoyed seeing me struggle. Thank you for watching, and until next time, bye!